So we have the same sort of description in this case that we had in the previous example, except instead of having uh, two individuals uh, choosing a strategy, we've got two firms. And I'm going to suppose that we've got an oligopoly that has just um, two firms in it. So that's a special case, and it's called a duopoly. I'm also going to just uh, make the very simple assumption that each firm has a choice of only uh, two different strategies, that is, two different prices that it could set. One is a high price. We could think of that as the monopoly price. Another is a low price, something that's significantly different from that. What's illustrated in each of these uh, cells or boxes are what are technically called payoffs. That is, the, uh, in this case, we can think of them as the profits that each firm is going to get as a result of its choice of strategy. So what's going on here is that if, let's, if we just run through uh, the example, uh, if firm one chooses the low price and firm two also chooses the low price, then we end up in this uh, box here where firm one gets a payoff of four and firm two gets a payoff of five. You could think of that again as profits in dollars or millions of dollars or whatever. On the other hand, if firm one chooses the low price and firm two chooses the high price, then firm two ends up with a loss and firm one ends up with large profits. You could easily tell a story about why that would be the case. Presumably, if firm one chooses the low price, it takes a lot of customers away from firm two, and firm two could be left with losses, while firm one ends up with large profits. So let's consider, uh, given the situation that I've described here, which price uh, each firm is going to choose. I invite you to just pause the video at this point and just think about it for yourself. Uh, think about it from the point of view of, say, firm one, and ask what would be the best strategy for you to choose, given that you don't know what strategy firm two is going to choose. So, in effect, what we're assuming is that this game, this situation, uh, is going to be played like the Golden Balls game, where each firm is going to reveal its price at the same time to the other firm. This particular uh, structure is called a prisoner's dilemma, for reasons that are explained in your, uh, in your text, and I'm not going to bother with here. So, just spend a few minutes uh, thinking about this, and then I'll run through the solution. All right, let's look at it from the point of view of Firm 1. Firm 1 wants to think, what do I do if, for example, firm two chooses the low price? If I choose the low price, I get a payoff of four. If I choose the high price, I'm going to face losses of eight. So it's clear that if firm two chooses the low price, firm one would be best off choosing the low price. On the other hand, firm one could say, what do I do? What would I best do if firm two chooses the high price? Well, given the numbers that I put here, firm one is going to be best off choosing the low price, undercutting firm two and getting profits of 60 instead of profits of 45, which it would get if it chose the high price. 
Conclusion, no matter what firm two does, high price or low price, firm one is best off choosing the low price. The Prisoner's Dilemma story is uh, symmetric. So the numbers don't have to be exactly symmetric, but the reasoning is. So if we think of it from the point of view of firm two, firm two could say, what strategy, high price or low price, is best for me, given the strategies that firm one might choose? So firm two will think, if firm one chooses the low price, it's better for me to choose the low price and get five, rather than to choose the high price and lose ten. If, on the other hand, firm one chooses the high price, it's better for firm two to choose the low price strategy, because 58 is bigger than 40. So firm two concludes, no matter what firm one does, it's better for me to choose the low price strategy. Therefore, both firms are going to end up choosing the low price strategy, getting a combined profit of nine, where they could have both had much higher profits had they somehow been able to choose the high price strategy at the same time. So you can see the parallel with the golden balls example, where there's a lot of incentive for each player to choose steel. They end up with a very poor outcome, sort of parallel to this one, instead of splitting and both ending up much better off, uh, collectively at least. So we end up with uh, what could be called an equilibrium in this situation. Given that each firm has chosen the low price, there doesn't seem to be an incentive to move away from that and choose a high price, because if any one firm did that, then, say, if, if firm one imagines, well, what if I'd chosen the high price, that would hardly be attractive. So what do we learn from this simple story? If people only think about themselves and they make sort of short-term, uh, greedy, self-interested choices, then everybody ends up with a worse outcome. Everybody understands that cooperation would be the best for everyone, but the way that this particular situation is structured, it can't really come about. However, if you think about it, this uh, situation that I've described is very artificial. Uh, very few situations, there are very few situations uh, in which firms just make a decision about, say, something like a price just once and have to commit to that and can't do something else uh, in the next week or the next year. Uh, there is one example, which is, let's say you're going to bid on a contract and you don't know what other people are going to bid. You have to write a number down and to commit yourself. So that would be a situation in which price is determined by uh, an auction. It's called a sealed bid auction. So uh, everybody writes down their bids and Nobody knows what anybody else has written down. So that would be a situation that would actually resemble a prisoner's dilemma. But in most markets, firms interact repeatedly, and they may get to know each other, in a sense. So that raises the question about whether some sort of cooperation is possible, or what is called tacit collusion. So this word tacit means that the uh, people involved, the businesses involved, don't talk to each other, but they kind of uh, observe each other's behavior and act accordingly. 
So as I emphasized, in the simple prisoner's dilemma situation, the players just choose a strategy once and have to commit to that. But in reality, firms can adjust their prices. They can see what other firms do, and they can respond to that. Your text has a very brief discussion about the, the names of those different kinds of strategic games. What we want to ask is, what could happen if firms can adjust their strategies and then respond to what other people are going to do? We might want to ask, is it possible to evolve some kind of cooperation between the players of the strategic game? One story that we could tell uh, that's kind of a, a, a classic story in thinking about oligopoly is to think of one firm as acting as what is called a price leader. Maybe the biggest firm in the market, might be the oldest one, might be just one that the other firms kind of understand is going to have a leadership position. And it might choose to change its price. Maybe it chooses a high price strategy. Maybe it raises its price. Now, that could be costly in terms of its profits, as we've seen in that earlier table, if the other firm uh, in the market chooses the low price. But the point, the whole point of raising the price by acting as a price leader is to say to the other firm, hey, why don't you raise your price too? And then we could both charge a high price and effectively act together as a monopolist and split the market up between us. The result could be what's called tacit cooperation. So again, it's tacit because there's no communication. Nobody uh, gets together uh, during a game of golf and agrees to raise prices or something like that. That would be called collusion. And I'll say a little bit about that later. Uh, just to give you an example uh, of how cooperation can evolve in what would seem to be very unlikely circumstances. Uh, there's a very nice book by, I think he's a political scientist, an American political scientist named Robert Axelrod, who a long time ago, maybe in the 1980s, wrote a book called The Evolution of Cooperation, where he looked at how uh, cooperation can evolve in various settings. And I believe he has a whole chapter, which I found uh, quite striking, on uh, the evolution of cooperation in World War I. So if you think about uh, uh, the situation, we've got two sides. Uh, in, in this case, these are allied soldiers, uh, probably British or maybe Australian, uh, who find themselves in France and uh, some hundreds of meters away are, uh, is the German army, uh, who've also got lots of artillery, and they could spend their days pounding each other with these very large artillery shells, pointlessly killing people on each side. So each side realizes they've got an interest in cooperating and not shooting at each other. And what Axelrod describes is how uh, that cooperation evolved. And so what ended up happening was that uh, they would fire some symbolic shots at each other, uh, making sure that the artillery shells landed in some place where nobody was going to get hurt, and then everybody could go off for tea or dinner or something like that and they could report back to the uh, headquarters that uh, shots had been fired and uh, the war had carried on. And this, uh, this kind of peace uh, lasted for some time in, in some sections uh, of, the, uh, of the front, but eventually, unfortunately, uh, the generals, who of course live in uh, 
fancy houses far behind the front lines, eventually found out about this and uh, sent explicit orders that senseless killing was to resume. Let's have a look at, uh, let's go back to the world of business and see uh, some strategies that firms have uh, to keep prices high if they've managed to evolve this kind of tacit cooperation. It was easy to find these images on the internet. I just uh, did a web search for something like, we will not be undersold. And you come up with these kinds of statements on the part of businesses. Now, if you're a naive person, you might just look at this and think, wow, this is a really competitive market. Uh, they're promising uh, fierce price competition. Nobody's going to undercut me. My price is going to be the lowest and so on. But what this really is, is an invitation to uh, other com competing firms uh, to maintain high prices. And it's really a threat. It says, if you put your product on sale, I'm going to cut my price. So I'm going to carry out a strategy of price matching. So you would be wasting your time to compete with me on the basis of price. Well, this kind of strategy that I've described is actually perfectly legal. Uh, even though it keeps prices high, nobody has undertaken a conspiracy. But we can find examples of illegal behavior, uh, formation of what's called a cartel. So a cartel, word that probably most of you are familiar with, is the idea that a bunch of sellers have kind of got together and they've cooperated, in this case, to fix prices at a high level. And if they were undertaking uh, uh, bids in the kind of auction that I described earlier, uh, they would get together and decide who was going to win a particular auction. And uh, they'd carry out what's called bid rigging. So the example I'm just going to mention is the case of uh, price fixing of bread that took place over the 16-year period uh, from 2001 to 2015. I believe this was actually initiated by uh, this collection of companies, uh, George West and George West and Bakeries and Loblaws, uh, which is the owner of the uh, Atlantic Superstore. Um, as you can kind of tell from the name here, uh, that this is owned by the Weston family, who incidentally have a net worth of about $9 billion US. So it's not exactly like they needed the money. But uh, anyway, what they did was they organized uh, a conspiracy to raise the prices of bread uh, across the country. And this was uh, actually discovered because they uh, confessed and thus uh, avoided any criminal charges while a federal agency called the Competition Bureau is investigating all the other companies that participated in this conspiracy. The conspiracy, in a sense, took place uh, in plain sight. Uh, Statistics Canada, every month, goes out and collects the prices of goods and services out there in calculating uh, the consumer price index. So those of you who've taken macroeconomics will be familiar with that idea. I won't go into this in any detail, except simply to point out that if you look at the uh, percentage change of prices of bread, rolls, and buns, which is a particular category uh, that Statistics Canada collects prices for, <coughs> you can see that those prices increased far more, looks like about 80%, uh, increase from uh, the early 2000s compared with other 
uh, food prices. So if anybody had been paying attention to that particular category, they would have noticed that something very weird was going on. I'll just quickly give you one more example. Um, there's a federal agency uh, called uh, the Competition Bureau, which I just mentioned, that enforces federal competition policy. Um, last year, uh, there were a couple of firms that produced software that's used for valuing oil and gas reserves. So these were the two main companies in this particular market, and they indeed acted as rivals. They didn't compete on the basis of price, but they competed on the basis of the quality of their software. And what happened was that uh, uh, one of these companies was purchased by an American company, Toma Bravo, which then proceeded to buy the other one. In other words, to create a monopoly. And the Competition Bureau uh, is challenging that in court, uh, saying that the loss of competition that's going to result is going to be bad for the public interest. So that uh, case, as far as I can tell, is still before the courts and still ongoing. So what can we say about oligopoly? In general, we can't really say very much. Uh, firms may find a way to cooperate, or they may not. They may act as rivals, as we just saw in that previous example, or they may be able to carry out either tacit collusion or criminal conspiracies. That's the thing that makes the analysis of this kind of uh, market so difficult. But what certainly is true is that uh, to protect the public interest, competition policy is needed to prevent the kind of abuses that we saw, say, in fixing the price of bread. So that's uh, all I'm going to say about the case of oligopoly. 